Dressing up as a cartoon animal might seem silly, but to some, it's the perfect temporary escape. Welcome to the furry fandom. A furry is someone who likes anthropomorphic or human-like animals. Think Bugs Bunny or just about any Disney animated movie. In the furry fandom, you get to create the character that you play rather than being the identity you were given at birth. However, not everyone understands the fascination with anthropomorphic animals, and many outside of the furry fandom are judgmental or carry negative misconceptions about furries. The way they talk about furries is so like, they, they say it with disgust almost. So if furries are misunderstood by many, how do they protect each other? That's exactly what I want to find out in this episode. I'm going to meet with furries and furry researchers to better understand what it means to be a furry. Meet Sprinks, a furry living in the Bronx. She's known on TikTok as Boogie Down Fur and uses her platform to correct misconceptions people might hold about furries. Yeah, so my name is Amanda, uh, I'm 26, and this is my girl Sprinks. And uh, we are Boogie Down Fur. People see a furry and they're like, oh, she, like you said, she's gotta be a deviant, for a lack of better words. The fandom is mostly about creating a safe space for you know, like I said, those who want to explore parts of themselves that, that they don't normally feel comfortable exploring or that just want to have fun or that are into the art. Even though the furry fandom is a fun hobby for many, there's still a lot of people on the outside that don't understand it. In the world of furry, you aren't strapped down to the person you were born as. You get to create the character you want to be. This is called your fursona. Many furries wear elaborate costumes called fursuits. And at conventions, furries without a fursuit will wear badges that display their fursonas proudly. To get a broader perspective of furry, I talked to Dr. Sharon Roberts, a sociologist who studies the fandom with the Fur Science Project go to a convention and the first thing that you're asked is what do you want your badge name to be? Most furries don't have fursuits. Uh, it's about 25% yeah. of the fandom that has one. In the furry fandom, people don the characteristics of the animal characters they're playing. For many who struggle with communication, a fursona can ease the burden. Your fursona helps signal to others how you'd like to be treated. For example, if I'm a nervous person that likes head pads, I can present as a shy or bashful puppy. Your fursona can also help you experiment with new character traits that you might be too shy to try in your human form. Like when I put my fursuit on, some part of me inside that I just can't express normally for whatever reason, whether it be fear of judgment or just my anxiety won't allow me because like, you know, I'm just, I'm a very timid person, but I'm also really extroverted. Use the fursona to engage in conversations with each other. So for those who are shy, um, you know, those who are autistic, th that this becomes a really good point of being able to communicate in ways that are socially supported. I do feel that, you know, people get more curious about it because everyone has thought at some point, oh, what would I be if I was an animal, you know? Yes, I have like, had this conversation so thought. many times, yeah. like, what animal would you want to be? Like, just that question. Yeah, like, that's, and that's where it starts. I've asked that to people all the time, and I've thought about that all the time of, like, ooh, maybe I want to be something that flies because how great yeah. would it be to fly? Like, we can't fly as humans. I've been fascinated by the furry world for a long time, and I decided I want to try creating a fursona of my own, but I had no idea where to start. So I want to create my own fursona. Okay. Can you like give me some tips? Honestly, that comes with what animal you choose. I feel like I like to go off of like what animals I pick. So like a fox and a lynx creating a finx, like it would have the the silly quirky nature of a fox, but also have the cunning and like attitude of a cat and a lynx. I've always had some goth tendencies and I've long been drawn to the mystique of fuzzy bats. Oh, I love bat fursuits. Hmm, a rave bat. If it's a rave bat, it's yeah. either base the bat. I love to draw, so I spent my Saturday working on my fursona. Creating a fursona to embody was too much fun. The creative potential is limitless.
Today, a majority of furries identify as LGBTQ, and since its beginnings, the fandom has been a safe space for the LGBTQ community. They are 85% LGBTQ, a quarter to a third transgender, um, you know, bullied at uh, proportions that are twice the rate of population levels. You know, th these are marginalized and vulnerable people who are sticking up for each other. Because the furry fandom is such a safe space, and it's a very anonymous space at that too, because when you're in suit or when you're online, it's mostly just your character online. So like people don't have like pictures of themselves as a profile, you know what I mean? It's their character. Um, I think it's just a safety thing. I think it's just a, you know, they feel comfortable. The furry fandom branched off from the sci-fi convention circuit during the 1980s, and with the growth of the internet, the fandom has continued to grow. I don't think it's a bad thing that the furry fandom has a reputation that makes vulnerable people want to be a part of the group. Word gets out. I, I think the fandom may grow uh, in that way, in that way as well. Now furries across the world yap, yowl, and squeak about all their favorite anthropomorphic animals, both online via social media and in person at conventions. I've even befriended many furries in the virtual reality spaces I've been exploring for subculture. Well, I guess I wanted to start talking about how you knew that you are a furry. How did you discover the world and then how did you know that you were wanted to be a part of it? I actually was furry before I knew about the furry fandom. We end up creating our own characters, sort of role-playing as them, and then we find out, hey, there's a bigger community out there. What are the biggest misconceptions that you think the public has about furries? A lot of people think furry is about fetishes. Furries actually think that other furries are more into the sexual components and the pornographic components of the furry fandom than they actually are. I do want to make sure that we correct misconceptions that are commonly held. So if that is a big misconception that people kind of overestimate the amount of sex in the furry fandom, then I think that's important to know. Some of these um, factors get a lot of attention in the media. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, suggesting that that's not a thing that ne it, that it never happens. But the people that we've studied, and we have studied over 40,000 furries um, from 70 different countries. So, you know, can you find instances of it? Sure. And what happens between consenting adults is consenting adults' business. Um, but I, that that does not represent the vast majority of the fandom. It's possible that this misconception of furries has come from early portrayals of the fandom in media. For example, in 2001, Vanity Fair published an article that focused on the sexual aspects of the furry community. A few years later, a popular CSI episode called Fur and Loathing was released that portrayed a group of furries in a sex scene. Today, furries are negatively stigmatized by the public, and they face threats of violence online. Furries have been targeted by anti-furry groups that harass them. It's now hard to find furry hate pages on social media, and posters on sites like 4chan and Something Awful have organized trolling efforts against furries. Furries face danger in person, too. In 2014, a suspected chlorine gas attack sent 19 Midwest Fur Fest attendees to the hospital. Police investigators said the gas may have been released intentionally, and while no suspects have been found, Chicago police say they still consider it a criminal investigation. We, we generally keep an eye on their, the, the chat rooms of hate groups, so we have to watch hate group chats 24-7 pretty much all the time for years and years and years. Uh, furries have been doing this since dial-up internet. It is funny that furries have to watch hate groups, but hate groups have tried to ruin furry events for decades. It's crazy, but... Um, yeah, furries are very protective of their friends because generally furries have chosen the community as their family um, and we don't want our family to get hurt. Disinformation about furries has spread across social media sites. A Nebraska lawmaker even fell for one rumor when he claimed that schools were providing litter boxes for children that self-identified as animals. That a, that a student identified as a cat and wanted a litter box. And the school didn't provide the litter box, so the student went ahead and defecated on the floor. Later, Bosselman contacted the school districts and the district leaders confirmed the rumor was not true. Bosselman apologized for publicizing a false story. 
Because furries face stigmatization and are misunderstood by many, the furries I talk to say it's important for the community to protect each other. When it comes to the fandom and stuff, like it's it's really such a safe space, and that's why we protect it so hard. Because you know, we're dealing with you know sensitive people. The big things that aren't tolerated are generally uh, harming others, uh, abuse. That's not tolerated. So abuse, whether it's physical or verbal harassment is generally not tolerated at all. Bigotry is certainly not tolerated because it goes against the core values of furry, trying to be your true self. I feel like it's not my place to judge anybody, especially since I'm a furry. Like that's as, <laughs> that's as weird as it gets in terms of the eyes of the public. The furry fandom is growing fast. Fursuiters are spotted in more countries all the time, and some hope that this will help reduce the negative stigma furries face. For a long time, furries have been misunderstood by media and the public. But the furries I've talked to are hoping to change that, so more people can feel safe having fun how they want to. If you've been enjoying exploring subcultures with me, I'm sure you're going to love the newest show in the PBS family. America Outdoors Understory with Bear Tunde Thurston. It's a show that explores the unique way people interact with the natural world. In it, you're gonna meet everyone from surfing scientists to fossil hunters. So check out the link in the description and don't forget to tell them that Subcultured sent you.